Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Born amidst salt and smoke, just off the Long Island Expressway, and beneath a bleeding star. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, as always, it's John. We will dispense of the pleasantries and get right into part two of our series going deep on Sir Jorah Mormont, the exiled lord of Bear Island. The Mormons we know, the Mormons we don't know. As of A Song of Ice and Fire, this is basically the Mormon family tree. These are all the Mormons that we know about throughout history. And it starts with Jorah Mormont. So we don't know anybody before Jorah Mormont. <laughs> and... His pants were the mini chlorians. It looks like it looks like every Mormon we know came from mini chlorians. Jura Mormon marries an unknown woman. Okay, he has a sister, Mage Mormon. Mage Mormon may or may not have married an unknown man, but she had kids with an unknown man. Jura Mormon and his unknown wife had one known son, Jura. So Jura Mormon is Gior's heir. Jura Mormon. He marries a Glover. Where this Glover woman sits in the Glover family tree, not known. The Glover woman had three miscarriages. The third miscarriage killed her. So Jorah has no kids. He marries again, and this woman was Lynnes Hightower, which is the story that he famously tells Daenerys. I think it's in Clash of Kings that he tells the story about Lynnes Hightower. I had no money. Yeah. An expensive wife. Dude, she was a, a gold digger for sure. And she seems like she was like just like a total bitch, right? Yeah. And she puts Jorah into a bad place. But that's Jorah's family. Unknown wife, one son, who had two wives. One died, one bounced, no kids. Mage Mormon, on the other hand, she had a lot more children with her unknown husband or unknown baby daddy. She had five children, but they were all daughters. Daisy Mormon's the oldest. Followed by Alisane Mormont, then Lyra Mormont, then Jorel Mormont, not to be confused with Jorel of Krypton. And finally, everybody's favorite Mormont, Liana Mormont. Of her five daughters, only one married. Alisane married an unknown man, obviously, and had two unknown children. Older unknown child was a girl, and the younger unknown child was a boy. And basically, the fates of the majority of this generation of Mormons is pretty shitty. Gior gives up Bear Island to join the Night's Watch, and he ascends to Lord Commander, but he's killed by his own men at Crasher's Keep beyond the wall. Jorah's fate, will you know, we'll get into that. The mage Mormon inherits Bear Island from her nephew Jorah when he skips town. She answers Rob Stark's call of the banners, and she answers the call of the banners, and she goes on Rob's campaign into the Riverlands during the War of the Five Kings. She actually lucks out. She travels with her king to the Twins, to see Edmure Tully have a boring, totally safe wedding. But she unfortunately misses out on the festivities because Rob Stark commands her to return north via Sea Guard and the Neck to seek out Greywater Watch. Her and I think it's Galbar Glover, they take separate boats with false plans written down, trying to find the reeds. Lady Mage's eldest daughter and heir, Daisy Mormont, is not as lucky. She attends the Red Wedding and she does not have a good time. She actually catches a battle axe to the gut, which is a pretty shitty death. Yeah. Pretty gruesome. We may touch on these other Mormons again, but Sir Jorah Mormon's narrative is basically away from the rest of his family. And even in Game of Thrones, we haven't had a Mormon reunion yet. And I I don't know if a reunion with Sir Jorah and Lyanna will have an emotional punch at all. I don't even know if he would recognize her, how long he's been gone from Bear Island. But... I did think of something, and I needed to ask you a question. While I was reading about G.R. Mormon, it talked about his pet raven. And I can't remember if the raven was featured much or at all in the first season of Game of Thrones. Do you recall if Mormon's raven was part of his shtick in season one? 
Ah, uh, God, I'm trying to think now. I'm trying to think back to the scenes. Because it was such a large part of his character in A Song of Ice and Fire. I can't remember. Can't remember. Then, then the Raven stayed with John. Yeah, which was cool imagery. And, and I feel like Benioff and Weiss kind of missed the boat a little bit by not... Because they right. definitely didn't include, they didn't include the Raven with, with Jon Snow when he became... No, the definitely Raven. not. Definitely not. The key thing about the Raven is he mostly just says the same word three times. And mostly it's corn, corn, corn. Right. Except for that one time where strike me dead that I read too much into this stuff <laughs> and it, and it's all just you can't tell me that all this stuff in the end is just going to be oh fooled you right but when Jorah's there and he's sitting with Jon Snow the raven saying king king right. king croak the raven right king the bird said again all the while his eyes never left Jon Snow and they were to- they were talking about Rob at the time, right? How Rob had become king in the north, and then the bird said, King, 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 looking at Jon Snow. Yeah. Now, right on. Obviously, it's foreshadowing because Jon became king in the north, at the very least. As far as Gior, the father, in terms of like a Westerosi lifespan, Gior Mormont lived like for eons and eons. Yeah, the old bear. Every other house, every other character, we don't know when they're born, right? But then you get House Mormont, who we don't know anything about, but we definitely know that Gior was born in 230 AC. He was murdered by Night's Watch mutineers in 299 AC. I guess it was about midway through A Storm of Swords. So six, 69 years old, which is like as old as it gets in Westeros. Mm-hmm. I didn't personally do the math or think about it all that much because, again, I don't think any of these facts are super important to Song of Ice and Fire. I just think they're somewhat relevant to Jorah. But all signs point to... Lord Gior Mormon giving up lordship of Bear Island just before Robert's Rebellion. Like I said, I don't think there's anything to read into that in terms of the rebellion or Southern ambitions being a reason for him taking the black. I think it is maybe a little bit curious that Benjamin Stark would take his vows that he would join the Night's Watch a short time later, just after the conclusion of the rebellion. Maybe the coming rebellion, the moving political pieces. In both the South and North. Well, I'm going to stop you right there. The reason why they both do that because they have to go up North to make sure that Rhaegar Targaryen stays as Mance Raider and right. Arthur Dane. Yeah, all that. They were si- a special assignment by Ned, mm-hmm. who will return, by the way. He became a cat. <laughs> he he worked into uh, Sir Pounce. It doesn't seem like any of that had to do with Jorah's decision, though, in all honesty. It's most likely just face value. Geo Mormon gave up his seat and joined the Night's Watch so that his son and heir could ascend to Lord of Bear Island. And we know Gior rode rapidly through the ranks of the Night's Watch. He was elected the 997th Lord Commander in 288 AC, and he succeeded Lord Commander Corgyle. Who was qu- was he quite old Corgyle also? Yeah. Yeah, he was he was pretty old and it's it's not like fact. I'm just kind of taking it from Corgyle going into Gior Mormon, but it's kind of like Gior Mormon's election signified a change in focus of the Night's Watch. Mm -hmm. Corgal seemed to stick to the old ways of protecting the wall, commanding the Night's Watch as though it was still in its prime years, as though it had enough manpower to follow regular patrols and defensive schemes. Gior was far more concerned with the declining number of recruits joining the Watch and the increasing number of wildings making attempts to cross the wall into Westeros. So when he became Lord Commander, he knew he didn't have enough men for proper patrols. So he changed patrols and defensives to better reflect the reality of the Watch's manpower. So instead of following regular patrols, which would be unreasonable and basically impossible, he would send patrols at random intervals and irregular patterns. So it meant less defensive patrols, but also meant that any wildings looking to climb or pass the wall, they could never be sure when the patrol would come because there was no Mm -hmm. set schedule of it. His first ranger was Benjamin Stark. And maybe Benjen Stark had a particular mysterious reason for joining the Night's Watch. I think it's more likely that he had been kicked out of Winterfell by his brother Ned, Ned's wife, Ned's new son, and the baby thought to be Ned's bastard. Benjen was probably pretty happy to leave Winterfell at that point in time to avoid the awkwardness that would ensue. He's like, well, my father Troy sent up all my brothers with people and... 
My sister did too, and look what happened. I'm just better off taking the oath. I'm out of here. <laughs> and Ned comes back with a bastard. He's like, yeah, my wife's on the way with my kid. Benjamin's like, I'm out of here. I ain't sticking around for this. I guess I'd, I had thought of this before, but maybe not. I don't know. But it's kind of interesting the role that Gior and Jorah play to Jon Snow and Daenerys Targaryen in the beginning. Right. It's the connection point. Yeah. Like each woman introduces a character that becomes a major protagonist to their new surroundings and function as like a guide to their new and unfamiliar reality. Right. Daenerys with the Dothraki and Gior with Jon and the Night's Watch. These seem like important minor characters with no thought giving to their backstory. Right. They're just there. They were just the ones picked. <laughs> yeah. Just always there. Always had long claw. In A Song of Ice Fire, Jorah Mormon doesn't look like Ian Glenn, the large hairy man. He has a full black beard and he's balding. He looks actually more like Stannis. He's strong, quite fit. He fucking wears wool and leather. In a desert. <laughs> 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 crazy ass night. <sighs> Who's that? I think it's Tyrion that says something like, only a knight of the Seven Kingdoms would be crazy enough to wear wool and leather. <laughs> Fucking Dothraki, see. Despite being an exile, he still wears the sigil of his house on his tunic. So that first marriage to a girl from House Glover. He married at a young age. Glover girl is unknown, much like all the spouses of all the Mormons. Unknown people. But Jor alluded that the marriage was more for his father than himself. Like it was something that his father really wanted him to do. And the marriage lasted. It lasted for 10 years. But this unknown Glover girl was not able to have a child. And she died as an unknown Glover girl following her third miscarriage. So it's probably likely that Gior always planned to spend his final years at the wall with the Night's Watch. But maybe relinquishing his lordship of Bear Island meant that his son would inherit his birthright. And maybe after the death of his wife, Jor thought that being the lord of a small island full of trees and bears and big hairy women he was related to would help Jor get over the death of his wife. And whether it did or it didn't, Jor gave his son Bear Island and he seemed quite motivated to get out of Bear Island himself, Jor. Yeah, you're the lord of Bear Island and you want to join the Night's Watch. Like there's the whole argument of honor, but it just sounds like a really boring, shitty place. Like Seattle. I'm the mayor of Seattle. It's like, eh, I think I'd rather join the Night's Watch than rule Seattle. Like we said, Jorah took the black not too long before the events of Robert's Rebellion. So it fell on Jorah to make the important decisions for House Mormon during the Civil War. And obviously he sided with his northern overlord and he stayed faithful to Winterfell. And that shouldn't really be a surprise because if legend is correct, his northern overlord's forefather gave his family Bear Island after he won a wrestling match. So like they should be pretty loyal to the Starks, all things considered. And I think it's through Jorah's own words. I mean, obviously Jorah Mormon, he's not a point of view character, but in stories that he tells, mostly to Daenerys, we learn that the new Lord of Bear Island was present at the Battle of the Trident. And I think he talked about that in the TV show also. It seems like he also must have raced south with Ned when Ned raced to King's Landing because he, Jorah, that is, claims to have seen the aftermath of Tywin's sack of King's Landing. Would you consider Jorah, I mean, we laugh at him. He's funny because of the horrible things that happened to him. Some of them his own fault for decisions he's made, but would you consider Jorah Mormont to be like a dark or edgy character? Uh, I don't think so, no. He has moments when he fights uh, whatever blood rider he fought in a Game of Thrones. Like He has moments where he's, he's pretty badass. Yeah, but then he has his whole infatuation with Daenerys, which is just like a joke. At least in Game of Thrones, I feel like that overshadows the cooler characteristics of him. Well, that's what he always think of at first with Jorah. Like, oh, Captain Frenjo. Yeah. It doesn't make us like him less. Right. You really forget that, you know, although he was from the north, he has been knighted. They do call him Sir Jorah Mormont. Right. Although there is something to that. Well, first, as far as him being dark and edgy, here's the reason I ask. Life seems like it's just plain shitty in Westeros for everybody. Even the wealthy of the High Lords, living in Westeros seems like a very dangerous thing. So maybe Jorah's experiences are no worse than any other noble lord or noble person. And there were a lot of miscarriages in this time period in Westeros, but he lived through three miscarriages. The third one killing his wife of 10 years. You could look at it as though his father was giving him the gift of Bear Island, but you could also look at it as though Jorah abandoned the family shortly after his wife died. 
And really, his first experience of war was the Trident. Before that, there was a major battle that he was involved in. There was just wrestling matches. Just just fucking Bear Island wrestling matches. We're going to solve this Bear Island style. So the Battle of the Trident is his first experience of war, which is pretty heavy due to battle. It's a, it's a battle that alters the course of Westerosi history. And then following that up with the fucking shit pile that Tywin turns King's Landing into, I just kind of think that like experiencing all these events must have taken faith in humanity. It must have taken a lot of good nature out of Jorah Mormon. So then if you combine that with Lynn Hightower a few years later, it's almost natural that like he followed this period of his life, which became violent and horrible. He followed that up with an infatuation with a woman that like he had to know she would never be happy living in Bear Island. And he had to know that he would never be happy with her on Bear Island. It didn't make any sense. It was like doomed from the start. Mm -hmm. Come up north. I got a great yeah. scenic. I got an island, baby. <laughs> You like bears, trees, rocks, <laughs> log halls, I got you. After the War of the Usurper, Jorah, still a new lord, he receives multiple marriage offers from other houses. And I have to think that these offers are the tall hearts, you know, the wolves, you know, northern houses. Right. But, of course, the offers are unknown. <laughs> like everything else. We don't know for sure. But he bit his time. He didn't make a decision. And before he could make a decision about remarrying, Balin Greyjoy claimed the sea stone chair. And he styled himself King of the Iron Islands. So in 289 AC, the Greyjoy Rebellion saw a reunion of basically all the big winners from the War of the Usurper. So it is canon. And it's not spoken of by George, spoken of by, I think, by Sir Barristan. And many that fought on Pike at the climax of that war say that Jorah Mormont showed great courage. He was one of the first men through the breach. But I got to wonder, like, is that bravery or is that, like, based on everything that happened in his life, again, his wife dying, seeing King's Landing, his father bouncing. He's the Lord of Bear Island, which is basically trees, bears, and his fat aunt and his his cousins. Maybe it was a little bit of a death wish going through the breach first. It's like something weird for a Lord to do. Like, like it's a knight, usually, that goes through the breach first. But still, for his efforts in the Great Jorah Rebellion, Lord Jorah Mormont becomes Sir Jorah Mormont. Which is like kind of a demotion, technically. Pop quiz, do you know who knighted Sir Jorah? Uh, Thoros Amir. Nope. I'll give you a hint. Was not. No, it wasn't Thoros, but I'll give you a hint. He was there fighting, that's why. He was fighting alongside him, but the man that actually knighted him, the Song of Ice and Fire fandom on the subreddit Free Folk, they call this man the real king of Westeros. They call him King Bobby B. Robert Baratheon, the usurper? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Have you checked out subreddit Free Folk? No, I don't, I don't it's go so on. It's funny, bro. It's awesome. They call him King Bobby B. They love Robert Baratheon. I don't know why, but but he knights Sir Jorah. The question is, so going back to your point about Jorah being a knight, he was knighted, but was he anointed by the High Septon? A knight can make a knight, but you need to be anointed to be like an official knight. So it got me thinking, like, who actually calls him Sir Jorah in A Song of Ice and Fire? It's just the characters that he interacts with. Viserys, Daenerys, Illyria Mopatis, they all call him Sir Jorah, but none of them were there. None of them know him prior mm -hmm. to meeting him then and there. I mean, maybe Illyria Mopatis, but he's pretty shady. So it got me thinking, and I'm not sure, but like when he meets up with Tyrion, and I'm just talking a Song of Ice and Fire, he meets up with Tyrion or even Sir Barrison. I'm not sure if they call him Sir Jorah. Point being, if Robert Baratheon knighted him, it just seems unlikely that he was anointed by the High Septon. Because the High Septon, he wasn't on Pike, right, at the Battle at the battle of Pike. And it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if Jorah traveled to King's Landing to be anointed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know for sure which religion Jorah follows. It's unknown. But we know that in the North, there aren't many knights because to be a knight, one must be anointed by the Faith of the Seven. So, right. And the Faith of the Seven, is the, that's the prevalent religion in Westeros. But in the North, most of the houses, especially the older houses, they follow the old gods. It's unknown what House Mormon believes in. It's unknown what Jorah believes in. But it doesn't seem likely that he follows the faith of the seven. It doesn't seem likely to me that he's a man of faith at all. The things that have happened to him in his life. Point being, he may have been knighted by King Robert. I'm not disputing that, but I don't know if he's a legit knight. I don't think he was anointed. And I think when Illyrio Mopatis calls him Sir Jorah, I think it's 
out of respect more yeah. than anything else than out of title. Or to get Vary, uh, Varys, to get Viserys to be more interested in taking him on in the service. Because again, we know that Ser Jorah was in the service of Varys um, as a spy on Daenerys at the beginning. And we know that Illyrio, Mopatis, and Varys, they have these plans together. So it makes sense that Illyrio wants Viserys to be impressed with Ser Jorah, the Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. And obviously Danny's never seen a knight before, so she's impressed. But he may not actually be a knight. He's a lord. Well, he was a lord. He's an exiled lord now. But going back to celebration of the victory over the Greyjoys, they have the, the tourney at Lannisport. And this is the story that Jorah tells Danny in The Clash of Kings. This is where he meets Lyness Hightower, who was <laughs> half his age. He thought she was real beautiful. He asked her for a favor to wear during the tournament, and she gave him a favor to wear. Jorah won the tournament. He defeated all challengers. He says he faced Sir Jamie Lannister last, and they broke nine lances to no result. So I guess he didn't win straight up. I guess it was a draw. Robert gave Jorah the victory, I guess just to rub it in on Jamie. Jorah named Lyness his queen of love and beauty. He asked Lyness's father, Leighton Hightower, for her hand in marriage that same night. And surprisingly, Leighton Hightower agreed. They were married in Lannisport, after which they returned to Bear Island. It doesn't seem like any thought was put into any of this on anybody's part. Leighton Hightower, I feel like they could get he could get a better marriage for his daughter. Mm-hmm. There was no one closer. Yeah, right? Unless maybe he didn't like his daughter. Like, maybe... And she was a bitch. You know, the marriage didn't remain happy for long. Having spent her life as part of House Hightower, which was a wealthy house in Old Town, she wasn't prepared for the harsh, lonely life on Bear Island. And she grew miserable. Jorah, I guess, is surprised that she's not enjoying Bear Island. So he attempts to reproduce the lifestyle to which his wife was accustomed. And this drove him to financial ruin. So I think he says like he brought singers and mummers and all these people to Bear Island to perform. <laughs> and it just drove him broke. Um, he gave her expensive gifts. He hired a cook from Old Town, a harper from Lannis Park. <laughs> we need those home cooked yeah. uh, high tower meals to keep this one happy. I just keep thinking about like like his aunt Lady Mage and like her daughters. What they're probably like, what are you doing? Like you're driving us to ruin for this fucking <laughs> He had a fine ship built and attended festivals with his wife. He borrowed from moneylenders while in Bravos. He participated in various tournaments, but he never duplicated his success at Lannisport. Desperate to pay off his debts, Jorah participated in one of the Seven Kingdoms' oldest taboos, slavery. And these were the poachers, or, I mean, we don't know for sure the story, because I don't think we ever hear the story from Jorah himself, but he captured poachers on his land and he sold them to a Tyroshi slaver. He, he talked to Danny about it. I know that in the show he talked to Danny about okay. it. Okay. He seems regretful, right? Not very like open about it, but he does mention because she's all about like, anti slavery, so uh, she questions him, you why did you right. and that's when he gets in the hole. I had no money. Expensive wife. I had to keep the bitch happy. <laughs> well, when his liege lord, Eddard Stark, learns that Jorah has sold poachers to a Tyroshi slaver, Eddard Stark condemns him to death. That's pretty harsh too. Yeah. And our Stark, bro, he's, he's got balls when it comes to that stuff, like right and wrong, or like the law. He don't care who it is. Uh, <laughs> See, the thing I don't get is if you're going to condemn a man to death, and then like, I, I don't know. Like, like if the cops are, are going to come and arrest you, like, do they call you for it? Like, we're going to come and arrest you. They don't give you a call ahead of time. So somehow Jordan knew that Ned was on his way to Bear Island. Right. You think he's just going to wait there? Like, hey, Ned, what's up? Uh, but, 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 he has, but, but here's the thing also. He has to find out that Ned's coming for him, Yeah, right? he has to. He also then goes back up north to drop off Longclaw. Right. <laughs> right. So I guess while Ned's at Old Bear Island, he's at the wall and goes down to King's Room and passes by. You keep your head down. Jor, <laughs> uh, sure, is that you? Uh, no. Okay. When the Warden of the North arrives on Bear Island to execute Jorah in 293 AC, Jorah has already fled with Lyness. But she leaves him anyways. Yeah. So, Longclaw, he, he gives back to Jor. He is a man of honor, Jor. He can keep the sword if he was abandoning his duties as Lord of Bear Island. But rather than join his father taking the black, Jorah took Lyness with him into exile. Jorah wanted to go to Bravos. Lyness wanted a warmer home, so they fled to Lys instead. Jorah sold a ship, but within half a year, they had no money left. So Jorah sold his service as a sellsword. 
While Jor was fighting the Bravosi on the Rhoyne, Lyness took Traegar Ormulin as her lover and moved into the Merchant Prince's manse. When Jor returned to Lys, Traegar informed him that he would be enslaved for his debts unless he gave up Lyness and left Lys. So Jor goes to Volantis. He's heartbroken. He spends the better part of a year in Volantis. He remains near the Free Cities, traveling as far east as Vase Dothrak. He spends time with the Dothraki, comes to learn their language, their customs. He's familiar with Ben Plum and the Second Sons, which is a storyline in A Dance with Dragons. So again, like a major plot point, we're not sure how, but Jorah becomes a spy for Lord Varys, who's King Robert's Master of Whispers. Jorah is present at the feast held in Drogo's manse in Pentos. He enters the service of the Beggar King, Viserys Targaryen, and he becomes a constant companion to the two Targaryens. During the wedding of Daenerys to Drogo, Jorah gifts her a small stack of old histories and songs of the Seven Kingdoms written in the common tongue, and Daenerys loves that gift like more than anything else she gets. When the Kalasar leaves Pentos the next day, both he and Viserys accompany them. Despite having sworn his sword to Viserys, Jorah's regard for Viserys is very low, and he begins to display more loyalty towards Daenerys than Viserys. I feel like from the get-go, he, he had, if not a thing for Daenerys, he definitely respected her more than Viserys, obviously. Mm-hmm. But like, what is real and what is him working for varies. He's showing more loyalty towards Daenerys. Is he really, or is he, is he just doing what a spy should do? And plus, then you get into the whole, what was the original plan while Viserys was alive? Viserys getting crowned by Khal Drogo, that has to throw a wrench into Varys' plan. The original marriage pact between Dorne and... Dary. Yeah. Viserys and Arion. That was it. It was Viserys and Arion, right? Mm-hmm. Which then becomes Daenerys and... What's his face? Quentin. Yeah, Quentin. The most important character in Song of Ice and Fire, according to... What's the fucking dude's name? Uh, God, uh, Jacobs. Yeah. Preston Jacobs. Yeah. I even forgot about him, man. I, he's had, I don't think he's done much lately. He's got a podcast now, but I, I would never listen to it. Thinking about it, that's really the most interesting part about Dorne, about House Martell in A Song of Ice and Fire. Obviously... Prince Oberyn is a great character, but if you think about just House Martell, what makes them so unique, what makes them so interesting is that they had this marriage pact in place when it looked like House Targaryen was extinct. Two kids and and an old knight, and the new king is trying to have them killed because they're a threat. The most interesting part about House Martell is that they stuck by them and made this pact. Right. I was just going to ask you that question. It's kind of... I guess sus- you know suspicious. I think maybe, I guess maybe we talked about, but you have Rhaegar Targaryen pretty much. I don't want to say throwing Elliot by the wayside. I think he still cared for her. Mm-hmm. I still think he wanted her to be protected. I don't think he ever would want her to be killed or anything like that. But you know he goes off with Lyanna, right? But they right. still mm-hmm. make this marriage pact. Yes, maybe it's just a question of what was worse for them. They probably consider Rhaegar not the type of guy that would do something to shame Elia. But he did shame her in a sense. To further upon that point, was there a divorce or was it going to be, you know, uh, an old school Targaryen marriage with multiple wives? I mean, if it was a divorce, then surely House Martell didn't know about that because I feel like their support for House Targaryen wouldn't be as much as it was. But at the same time, they lumped together with Robert Baratheon and the Rebellion. Tywin Lannister, Eddard Stark, the mountain that rides as being responsible for Ilya's death. So they can't side with them, you know? We'll find out the truth as far as Ilya and Rhaegar's marriage. When Game of Thrones, Bran said that they were going to get a divorce. No, no, Sam said they were getting a divorce, right? Annulment. Annulment, right. Because it was a loveless marriage. Understandable. Rhaegar, I'm sure, would have taken care of her. Like, he wouldn't have just tossed her to the side. I don't know if that's going to be the case in A Song of Ice and Fire. You think you think it's an annulment in A Song of Ice and Fire too? I would think it'd be more of a multiple wife wedding. I still lean towards that a little bit. The Martells wouldn't be upset because they would still have the airship because that's the first wedding marriage. Right. Whereas if it's a divorce you know, or annulment, then they're out. But then we get to the whole question, if it's not an annulment, if he's going to be married to Ilya and Lyanna, Aegon with Ilya is the heir. 
So then, as far as the prophecy, the child he has with Liana, in Rhaegar's mind, does the prophecy mean that that child has to be king? Or is that child just Azor Ahai reborn? He's a prince no matter what. He may not be the king, but he's still a prince. So is he the prince that was promised? Song of Ice and Fire, he's the one that fits it. He needed the woman from the north to do it. What I'm saying is it's not required for that prophecy. It doesn't say that he has to king. Okay. Because there's no way unless he annuls the marriage. And then it gets tricky because I feel like even if he did annul the marriage, if these kids and Ilya didn't die, even if the marriage is annulled, well, I guess then his children with Ilya are not heirs anymore. Mm-hmm. I really don't know. I don't know. Because they were born in a marriage, so they're not bastards. They can't become bastards. But they must get knocked out of the line of succession if their mother is no longer married to the crown prince. I don't know. It's easier for it to be an annulment, but somehow I feel like the way George is going to write it, it's going to be a a multiple wife marriage. What do you think about Jorah in in all this as far as Rhaegar, King Robert? He followed Ned, answered the call to the banners. That was his overlord, his warden of the north. But then this man is coming to Bear Island to kill him 16 years later or so. Jorah seems to talk like he has respect for Rhaegar, right? Especially in a TV show. Do you think this comes from Ned condemning him to death? Or do you think Rhaegar was that special of a person that even a guy like Jorah... I don't don't think Ned would have anything to do with his opinion about Rhaegar. Okay. They'd be more just his own opinion about Rhaegar. Which was pretty much shared by most people except uh, for uh, Bobby B. King Bobby B. (laughs) Drew says a couple times how much of Rhaegar he sees in Daenerys, but there's no evidence that he's ever met Rhaegar other than what he's heard of Rhaegar. So, right. is this just him bullshitting just Daenerys? Fluff. Yeah. Like, a little fluff. We need a little fluff of the uh, peanut butter. Fluff the young girl up, see if she <laughs> buys your bullshit. <laughs> I need a fluffer. <laughs> you know I have my own island. Well, I had my own island. Jor is secretly in the employment of Varys, the master of whispers for King Robert Baratheon, hoping to earn a royal pardon and return to Westeros from his exile. So he reports on the Targaryen's movements to King's Landing. He is quick to inform Robert about Daenerys' marriage to Drogo. When Daenerys becomes pregnant, Jor informs Varys as well, resulting in Robert's decision to have Daenerys, her child, and Viserys assassinated. Totally playing both sides at this point. Right, he's, he's doing just enough to give them information, so mm-hmm. he gets that part in, but he's still trying to hold back a little bit on ratting them out too, too much. He wouldn't get out alive if he killed Daenerys and the baby while with the Kalasar, but if he really wanted to get that royal pardon, he'd figure out a way for her to die. But instead, he it's like he sticks closer to her. Yeah, he's just totally playing both sides, but so is Varys. Like, what the fuck is Varys doing here? We assume, ultimately, that Aegon the Fake, Varys' son, Mopatis' son, whatever, whatever his relationship is, Blackfires, like, that's their ultimate play. But then Ares, possibly Viserys, are a part of that. So he doesn't really want Daenerys to be assassinated. Or does he? If Daenerys and the baby die, and Varys' ultimate plan is to have Aegon the Fake sit the Iron Throne... That still works, even if Daenerys is dead, right? Because he could still bring out Aegon, and he's still a Targaryen. Right. Well, the thought process is, well, if we get them together, then less people will question if it actually is the real Aegon. Because if he's with Daenerys, (laughs) they'll say, okay, it's really him. Right. But if Viserys had lived, hypothetically, how would that work with Aegon? Would Viserys be willing to give up his claim? Well, Viserys claims that a throne is... Based off... He's the last... But if Aegon's alive, it's Aegon, he has the higher claim. But then they was also denounced on Dragonstone with Rayella and Sir William Zary that he's the new king. Oh, right. Yeah, good call. That's right. I forgot about that. So either way, they would be hoping that they would be able to, be able to kill Viserys. Yeah, there's no way Viserys is living anyway, even if he survives Khal Drogo and, and that, that march with the Kalasar. There's no way that Varys was doing all this to put Viserys on the throne. Viserys was a pawn. Poor fucking guy. So Jorah spends time counseling Daenerys on the Dothraki way of thinking and living. She begins to really value her friendship with him. 
not realizing that he really just wants to bang her. Uh, Evades Dothrak, he threatens Viserys when Viserys attempts to steal Daenerys' dragon eggs. And we've talked about the dragon eggs before also, because Illyrio Mopatis gave them to Daenerys. There's no way that he knew that they would hatch. Like, there's no way that he could know that they would hatch. No, unless he was hoping for some blood magic. Yeah. Because Jory keeps on telling Daenerys, we should go to, um... Uh, Ashai. Yes. And that's where all the blood magic is. No, we should run to Ashai. What the fuck are you talking about, Ashai? Why would we go there? Yeah, it's true. Maybe maybe it has. I feel like we would have had that reveal by now, though. Jorah's given a place of respect at the feast after Daenerys eats the stallion heart. He's unable to calm Viserys when the would be king enters the hall drunk and watches as Drogo has Viserys killed. With molten gold. His adversary is like, Jor, kill them. And Jor's like, no way. He accompanies Daenerys and her escort to the Western Market, and he insists on visiting a caravan captain alone, which Daenerys finds odd, but she doesn't think too much into it, and this is where he's doing his spy shit. Illyrio has sent a letter warning that King Robert has promised a lordship to whomever slays Viserys. That's some fucking bad king shit right there. Promising a lordship to whoever slays Viserys, Daenerys, or her child. It's also pretty seriously like Jor returns to Daenerys' side just in time to confront a merchant about attempting to sell her poisoned wine. For his role in saving Daenerys and her unborn son, Drogo allows Jor to choose any horse from his herds, with the exception of his own stallion or Daenerys' silver. After Jor warns Drogo that there will be more attempts, Drogo declares he will invade the Seven Kingdoms. That's a fucking awesome scene. Yeah. He remains with the Kalasar as they travel south towards Lazar. And he participates in battle when Drogo falls upon the Kalasar of Cal Ogo, who had just sacked a town, the Lazarine. Daenerys doesn't like all the violence against the Lazarine. She orders Jorah to stop Drogo's men from raping a Lazarine woman. And although Jorah admires Daenerys' intent, he tries to explain that she cannot save all the women. Drogo gets wounded in the battle. And the woman that was being raped, Miri Maz Dur, has seen to his wound. The Cal ignores the Magi's instructions and his wounds begin to fester. When Drogo falls off his horse, Jor urges Daenerys to flee to Ashai. <laughs> there you go with Ashai. <laughs> uh, before Drogo dies, as her child will otherwise be killed, and she will be forced to join Dash Kaleen at Vaes Dothrak. It was so crazy, because she goes from, like, riding high on top of the world. Once he falls off his horse, like, she's just totally fucked. Yeah, done. And that really plays into her character. Her whole thing with trying to end slavery, like, she's a slave to the situation she's in there, and it has nothing to do with what she does. If her husband dies, she becomes more of a slave. Daenerys has Miriam as Dur perform blood magic on Drogo. This causes chaos in the Kalasar, and Jorah has to duel Quotho when Drogo's blood rider tries to stop the ritual. Although Quotho's Arak cuts off half Jorah's ear, I forgot about that, and wounds his hip, the knight is able to kill his opponent. When Daenerys goes into labor and the midwives refuse to come, Jorah, oh man, big mistake. Yeah. Jorah takes her into the tent, unaware that Miri has forbidden anyone from entering. So we never see Daenerys' child, but Rago is a stillborn monstrosity. She wakes from her fevered sleep, and a weakened Jorah is unable to tell her the truth about the child, so Miri tells her. Daenerys and Jorah believe that by carrying her into the tent during the ritual, Jorah inadvertently caused her son's death. He escorts Daenerys to Drogo, revealing that his Kalasar is gone and Drogo is now catatonic. Daenerys euthanizes her husband. I think she smothers him with the pillow, right? Mm -hmm. Preparations are made for Drogo's funeral pyre, but Jorah fears that Daenerys plans to commit suicide by entering the pyre with her dead husband. Instead, he begs her to come with him to Yiti to Karth, the Jade Sea, and of course, Ashai. Ashai. Once we get to the Ashai, baby. Daenerys promises she does not intend to die with Drogo. When she later asks the men from her cause, which were like her own security group, and Jorah to swear their service to her, Jorah is the only one to do so. Going back to Ashai real quick. I mean, obviously she didn't go there in Game of Thrones. It's been... Heavily rumored that she goes there in a song of ice and fire. I mean, what do you think? How does the saying go? She has to pass under the shadow or one of the fucking dozens of prophecies about Daenerys. Sounds like she has to go to Ashai before she can go to Westeros. I mean, if that's the case, there's going to be like four more books. 
But do you think we ever get to see Ashai? No. Eh, that's a good question, actually. It'd be a pretty cool place to see, but... Yeah, I don't think so. There's no time for it. No fucking time, man. This guy's written himself into such a fucking jam up that, like, he's got so much to do just to get his pieces to where they need to go. <laughs> Daenerys promises Jorah a dragon forged Valyrian steel longsword. <laughs> and she names him the first of her Queen's Guard. Jorah suggests selling the dragon's eggs and going to Ashai, but Daenerys has them placed upon Drogo's pyre. She has Jorah and Rakaro bind Miri Mazdur to the pyre. Here's something I never got with this whole thing. I mean, it's more Daenerys than Jorah, but like, how does she know that this shit's going to work? Like, how does she even know to do any of this? Right. Like, she's not familiar with blood magic. Even something like Miri Mazdur is even catching on to until it's too late. I don't know if I'll call it a plot hole, but it needed more explanation. They bind Miri to the pyre. Jorah shouts at Daenerys as she walks into the burning pyre, which kills Miri Mazdur. When the flames have finally died down and the ground has cooled, the next morning, Daenerys is amidst the ashes, unhurt, with three living dragons, and Jorah wordlessly falls to his knees while the remaining Dothraki swear at Daenerys their loyalty. And this was an awesome chapter. It's an awesome epilogue scene. Mm-hmm. What do you think about Jorah's arc, Game of Thrones, the book, season one, Game of Thrones? Did you like him from the get-go? Yeah, I was always a big fan. Something about him. And I always loved the Ian Glenn's performance with him. Yeah, maybe pound for pound, he may have done the best job overall for the amount of episodes that he's in. Can you blame him? The spot that he's in, not knowing Daenerys or Viserys being promised a pardon if he spies mm-hmm. on them. I mean, can you really blame the guy for doing that? He's thinking, how, how, how big can this be? But then he just starts falling for her. Is it that he's falling for her? Or is it the case like with Tyrion where he, you know, he starts to believe in her? Well, yeah, he falls for her, believes you know, and, and all that. Yeah, I guess it's tied together, right? His character works so well, especially in A Game of Thrones, because Essos and Vaes Dothrak, while we're just getting to know Westeros, we spend more time in Westeros, and the people of Westeros, the characters there, are closer to what we recognize as normal people. Whereas in Essos, it's much stranger, it's a stranger land, stranger customs, all different types of cultures and, and races. We've talked in the past about Ned introducing us to this universe, to the known world, being our moral compass. I don't think Jorah is anything like a moral compass, but he is a very grounded character. He's one that we all recognize, we all understand. So while he's introducing and guiding Daenerys through her time with, with the Dothraki, he's also functioning the same way for the reader and, and Game of Thrones TV show functioning the same way for the viewer. He's like your every man. I think he really stays like that throughout the series. An everyday guy. He makes mistakes, but he tries to redeem himself. He makes more mistakes. But he falls in love for the wrong reasons. And I think that's another theme with Jorah. If you go back and you look at Lyness, I wish we knew more about his first marriage. I mean, it lasted long enough, which says that he's dutiful. You know, I don't know what the pouring situation on Bear Island is, but I can't see it being that great. So maybe he wasn't faithful to his first wife, but he was with her for 10 years. His marriage to Lanes, it just screams of desperation. Him desperately trying to hold on to a good feeling that he had in winning this tournament, seeing her for the first time, riding high from being knighted, being the first to breach the wall on Pike, and this big victory and feeling such a big part of it. That emotional high for him, he was trying to hang on to that desperately with Lanes to the point where it all came crashing down for him. And he didn't really think. And I think that's what I'm trying to say about Jor is when it comes to positive emotions for him. He's not really able to identify why they're positive. And he looks to a woman that he has really no business being with, trying to hold on to her as a way of holding on to those feelings. And probably with Daenerys, you know, that time, especially right after Viserys' death, especially after the dragons are hatched, is probably the most important he ever felt in his life. I really can't stress enough that Bear Island must be like the most boring fucking lifestyle possible in Westeros. I don't think I would mind living there, the peace and quiet, but like, you know, for a guy like Jorah, even Gior, like Gior says he went to join the Night's Watch so that he could give Bear Island to Jorah, but it's like, all right, dude, well, maybe you hated your life living on Bear Island and you wanted out. You wanted to be in a Night's Watch for the last few years of your life. What is it that Gior says to Sam about Jorah, his last words? To Sam? That Crasher's Keep, as he's dying, doesn't he tell Sam? I, I can't die. I- 
Tell Jorah to take the black. My final wish. I'll find my son. Yeah. How did that work out? Because they finally met at the Citadel. And Sam told Jorah that Jorah was a great man. I think John told him pretty much the same thing. Was he there in the books or just the show? I mean, he just knows him in the show right now, right? Yeah. He didn't see him in the books. No, I didn't see him in the books yet. It's just going from the show. But I know in the books, Gior does say to Sam, Yeah. Tell my son to take the black. It's my last wish. Can't blame him. Your son commits a crime like he committed, which doesn't really seem like much of a crime. But especially for old school Northerners, taking the black is still a way to redeem sins that you've committed. You think Gior does end up taking the black? If he doesn't die, I think he does, yeah. Shit, what did we say? Did we say that he dies? I don't know. I forgot now. I know, I forgot too. I think we said that he lives. I think we said he lives. Because if you think about the things that he did, they're not that bad. And most of them he's already paid for and redeemed himself for. Tairoshi slavers. All right, he lost Bear Island. He had to be married to Liness. Financial ruin. He paid for that. Betraying Daenerys. He had doubts about that after he got to know her and he saved her life. He didn't tell her the truth. Till she found out. I don't think he's got like anything negative coming his way based on things that he's done. Possibly he could live. And if there is a Night's Watch, he could be the Lord Commander. I think it's very possible. We're going to stop there and we'll continue with Jorah Mormont via A Clash of Kings. Thanks for listening. You can find us facebook.com slash The Promised Princes. Follow us on Twitter where we tweet basically the same things we say on Facebook at Princess Promise. You can find our podcast, The Princes That Were Promised, on Apple Podcasts, in the Google Play Store on Stitcher, on SoundCloud. We're on Spotify now. Search for The Princes That Were Promised. You can find us on YouTube. Search for The Princes That Were Promised. Read The Westerosi Companion, The Princes That Were Promised.com. Like us, subscribe to us wherever you find us. Leave a review. Tell a friend, tell a family member. Thank you for listening, and we'll speak with you next time. Bum, 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 b